As Americans in the 21st century, we are fortunate to live in a nation of natural beauty and abundance. We live in a country where we can readily visit national parks, reserves, and wilderness and see astounding natural scenery and wildlife. Our country is famous for the majestic elk, the grizzly, the bison, and the wolf. But not so long ago, in fact, just 100 years ago, the fate of our wildlife was in its most precarious state. Many species were on the brink of extinction, and if the status quo of that time continued, today there would be no bison, grizzly, wolf, elk, cranes, none at all. We would have hunted them to extinction. However, Americans rose to the challenge. Instead of extinction, we chose the path of conservation and the wise use of our natural resources. We took action. We stopped the unregulated use and saved our wildlife. It was a conscious, measured, and deliberate effort on the part of various citizens, such as naturalists, policymakers, and especially the hunters and anglers of the time. How could such a tide be turned? How could a country restore nearly extinct wildlife to the abundance for which we are now known? The story is an amazing tale of national history, a story that can serve as a reminder for what we can accomplish when working together with a common goal. In this case, the goal was to save our wildlife legacy. How could such a tide be turned? How could a country restore nearly extinct wildlife to the abundance for which we are now known? The story is an amazing tale of national history, a story that can serve as It is a story of the evolution of what would become the world's most successful model for wildlife conservation, the North American model of wildlife conservation. The story begins with the founding of our country. When colonists first settled here, they encountered an abundance of natural resources. Settlers quickly learned which trees made the best lumber, which fields made the best farmlands, and which wildlife was the best game. For many early settlers, unregulated hunting was a privilege they had never experienced. Back in Elizabethan England, game belonged to the landowners who were usually royalty, and only the wealthy participated in big game hunting. Commoners were reduced to taking small game from the minimally available public lands. Hunting wildlife was an important part of the settling of this land. Wild game was crucial to the survival of the early settlers. Deer, turkey, moose, elk, and small game were an important part of the early American diet. Hide for clothing was also important. At the time, game was abundant and the bounty seemed endless. In addition to being an important source of food, wildlife was also valued for its fur and feathers. Many Europeans saw the natural bounty of the American wilderness as a source of wealth, with the fur-bearing animals such as beaver, marten, fisher, and wolverine being abundant, free for the taking, and whose hides were profitable to sell. What started as an exchange between European traders and the Native Americans became, for a time, one of the most profitable and important industries in North America. Beaver pelts were considered not only a measure of wealth and currency, but the most important natural resource to come out of the New World. Demand for furs in Europe grew, and more and more trappers came to the New World to partake in this bounty. By the 1700s, beaver became increasingly scarce in eastern North America. Trappers moved west, exploring the wilderness and extracting an abundance of pelts from the western lands. With a strong belief in manifest destiny, or America's right and duty to expand across the continent, the settlers pressed westward. More and more land was cleared for settlements and agricultural fields. Forests were cut for fuel wood and lumber. This westward expansion increased the demand for game. Wildlife continued to be an important food source, and hunting was a way of life in this growing country. By the 1800s, however, animals such as deer, bison, pronghorn, elk, and beaver were becoming scarce in some places, primarily due to unregulated hunting and loss of habitat. In 
first transcontinental railroad, completed in 1869, not only brought new settlers, but provided easier access to western hunting grounds. The railroad also made the shipping of animal hides to the east more convenient and economical for market hunters. Up to this time, hunting was mostly unregulated and unrestricted. In the eastern United States, where some wildlife had become noticeably absent, the first hunting restrictions that reduced hunting seasons, or bag limits, were imposed. However, the West was still wide open to unregulated hunting. There were no bag limits, and hunters were free to take what they could shoot or trap. While some conscientiously self-regulated their hunting, taking only what they needed, others made a living from hunting. Market hunting, the shooting or capture of wildlife for sale to milliners, restaurants, or other markets, became big business during the mid to late 1800s. Not only were market hunters taking fur-bearing animals, but market hunting for birds also became popular and profitable for food, down, and fashion. <coughs> the story of the demise of the American bison is well known to most Americans. Professional market hunters, responding largely to the demand for buffalo hides and meat, hunted the bison to near extinction in the late 19th century. Aided by the development of more efficient guns and the transportation opportunities provided by the railroad, unregulated hunting reduced the American bison herd from a population of at least 30 million to a few thousand. By the late 1800s, the American bison was on the brink of extinction. The slaughter of the southern herd was documented by William T. Hornaday, director of the New York Zoological Society. By 1889, the total number of bison running wild and unprotected was 635. Added to that were 256 captive bison and 200 that were under government protection in Yellowstone National Park. According to Hornaday, the whole number of individuals of bison americanus now living is 1,091. Bison were so scarce, hunting became unprofitable. However, herds in captivity and protected in Yellowstone slowly started growing. While most people know the story of the bison, few know that during the same era, other wildlife populations such as deer, elk, pronghorn, cougar, wolf, grizzly, turkey, and waterfowl were drastically declining. Habitat loss, market hunting, and predator eradication all contributed to the decline. In the eastern waterways and wetlands, waterfowl were being decimated by market hunters, with some species very near extinction. In the words of William T. Hornaday, of all the meat shooters, the market gunners who prey on wildfowl and ground game birds for the big city markets are the most deadly to wildlife. In an attempt to kill as many birds as possible in the shortest amount of time and with the least effort, market hunters employed a variety of techniques and weapons. To aid in the slaughter, gun technology advanced to ensure more take with fewer shots. The punt gun was a modified shotgun used by market hunters to kill waterfowl. It was mounted on a small boat and could shoot up to 100 birds in a single shot. Waterfowl are migratory birds and many species come from various breeding grounds in the north to only a few bays along the eastern seaboard to overwinter. These bays and marshes would harbor thousands and thousands of wild ducks, geese, and other waterfowl. These wintering grounds became a shooting ground for market hunters. In any market-driven situation, one cannot place all the blame on the supplier. Those in demand of the game meat were equally at fault. Game meat, furs, and especially ornamental bird feathers were all in great demand and very fashionable at the time. In addition to improved gun technology, developments in cold storage aided market hunters' endeavors. 
The number of wild birds taken by market hunters for food and fashion was driving some species to near extinction. When William T. Hornaday published his seminal book, Our Vanishing Wildlife, in 1913, some wildlife species had already been exploited to extinction or near extinction due to unregulated hunting. North American birds that were already or nearly extinct included the great auk, the Carolina parakeet, and the passenger pigeon. In addition to the loss of birds, several species of large mammals were in danger. Numbers of elk, deer, pronghorn, grizzly, and wolves were drastically declining. An entire subspecies of elk, called Miriam's elk, which occurred in the southwest, was eradicated before it could even be scientifically described. The last Miriam's elk was killed in Arizona around 1900. What had once seemed like an inexhaustible resource was dwindling to nothing. Many species were on the brink of extinction due to many factors, including unregulated hunting and unregulated timber harvest. As wildlife numbers dwindled in the late 1800s, it was clear something needed to be done. The exploitation of wildlife had to stop. To ensure America would have any wildlife in the next century, wildlife would have to be conserved and wildlife populations brought back from the brink of extinction. It was time to turn the tides and save our vanishing wildlife. But who would do it? While concerned citizens, scientists, politicians, and others championed conservation efforts, it was hunters and anglers, collectively called sportsmen, that took the actions that started wildlife on the road to recovery. By the turn of the century, sportsmen hunters had already been at work for several decades striving to turn the tide. First, hunters realized there was a division among their own ranks. Most hunters were not market hunters. They were gentlemen sportsmen that respected wildlife and the wilderness in which they lived. They were individuals with a passion for getting into the outdoors and providing meat for the table. They abhorred the slaughter by market hunters. Next, hunters also realized that as sportsmen, they must embrace a hunting ethic, a code of honor that incorporated the ideas of recognizing and honoring bag limits, season restrictions, and the concept of fair chase. For the most part, the public understood the concept that wildlife was held in the public trust. That is, wildlife belongs to everyone and is held in trust by the government. This principle, known as the public trust doctrine, can be traced to the Roman Emperor Justinian and was formalized by the Magna Carta of 1215. Although the Magna Carta was originally a document limiting the powers of the English king, it would become a foundational document for our own Constitution. A series of Supreme Court decisions, starting in 1842 with a case known as Martin v. Waddell, legally upheld the public trust principle as outlined in the Magna Carta. These rulings upheld the idea that natural resources such as water, fish, and wildlife are held in trust by the government for the benefit of all the people, today and in the future. Gear versus Connecticut in 1896 further solidified this idea. Although wildlife belonged to everyone, no one had the right to decimate wildlife populations for their own gain. But market hunters were doing just that. Sportsmen realized that in order to stop market hunting, commerce in wildlife would have to be abolished hunting would need to be better regulated. However, public and political support was needed. Sportsmen's clubs formed and sporting magazines were published to help build that support. Forest and Stream Magazine, first published in 1873, was one of the first sporting magazines to advocate for hunting regulations and the conservation of wildlife. In 1887, the Boone and Crockett Club was formed. It acted to promote fair and regulated hunting 
and would become a significant force for wildlife conservation and the elimination of market hunting. Although there are already numerous sporting clubs in existence, the Boone and Crockett Club, founded by Theodore Roosevelt, an avid sportsman but not yet president, would become the country's most influential. The club also worked to create wildlife reserves and promote the concept of fair chase. Other advocacy groups, such as the Sierra Club and Audubon Society, were founded during this era, each with a mission and message of conservation. This nationwide public outcry influenced a series of laws and treaties, as well as the creation of wildlife refuges, national parks, and other protected lands. In 1900, the Lacey Act was passed, making it illegal to move unlawfully taken game across state lines. This was the act to end market hunting. No longer could a hunter move hundreds or thousands of waterfowl, not even a single duck, from rich hunting grounds to out-of-state markets. Though it took a while for market hunters to comply, egrets in Florida were now legally safe from becoming hat adornments in New York. Around the same time, the concept of national parks and wildlife refuges was taking hold. More and more lands were being set aside to protect wildlife and wild lands. It was recognized that wildlife needed some undisturbed wild places to recover and thrive. Yellowstone, which had become the world's first national park in 1872, gained further protection in 1894 with the passage of the National Park Protective Act, which prohibited hunting and other potentially disturbing activities in national parks. In 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed, protecting migratory birds, their nests, eggs, and feathers. This significant legislation was among the first to recognize wildlife as an international resource. Nationally, lands were being set aside for wildlife, market hunting was outlawed, and migratory birds protected. Meanwhile, states were limiting the harvest by setting hunting seasons and bag limits. Enforcement was difficult, but sportsmen were encouraged to comply, honoring their code of ethics. At first, bag limits were set based on a variety of suppositions about wildlife populations and their movements. It was not until the 1930s that wildlife management became a science. Aldo Leopold, known as the father of wildlife management, developed the first graduate program in game management at the University of Wisconsin. In 1930, Leopold's American Game Policy was presented and adopted nationwide. This comprehensive policy established the era of wildlife management based on science. The policy, along with his publication Game Management, served as a guide for wildlife managers for decades and advanced the understanding of the balance of natural resources. As wildlife science developed, an understanding of wildlife populations and habitats grew, the management of wildlife improved. It was clear that science should inform the laws regulating hunting to ensure a sustainable harvest. A sustainable harvest meant that healthy wildlife populations could be ensured for the future by scientifically determining how many of a certain species could be harvested each season. Thus, Science informed wildlife law and wildlife populations began to grow as a result. As with the establishment of other laws and regulations, the public also had the opportunity to shape hunting and angling laws through the public process. State and federal wildlife regulatory agencies were established across the country. However, monies to support this new profession and these efforts were scarce. Many state agencies began requiring licenses to legally hunt and fish. The money from the sale of these licenses was used to fund wildlife management and conservation. Then, in 1937, following recommendations from the North American Wildlife Conference, the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, known as the Pittman-Robertson Act, was passed with strong support from sportsmen. This act placed an 11% excise tax on hunting equipment and ammunition, 
the funds were to be allocated by the federal government to the states to aid in the management and restoration of wildlife. In 1950, a similar act was passed to support fisheries. The Federal Aid in Sport Fish Restoration Act, Dingle Johnson Act, established an excise tax on fishing equipment and allocated the funds to the management and restoration of state fisheries. Along with the money collected from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses, these funds were, and still are, used for the restoration of wildlife populations, acquisition and enhancement of habitat, and other wildlife conservation and education activities that benefit non-game or non-hunted species, as well as game species. Over the years, wildlife populations recovered. The 20th century saw wildlife emerge from its darkest hour into a new light of conservation. To bring wildlife not only back from the brink of extinction, but to healthy and sustainable populations has been the legacy of the wildlife conservation movement in America. And the success shows. In the early 1900s, turkey, elk, and pronghorn populations, just to name a few, were at dangerously low levels. Now, a million or more of each of these animals roam the wilds of the United States. To this day, wildlife is still held in the public trust and everyone has the opportunity to hunt. The public also continues to shape wildlife conservation laws through the public process. Market hunting has been abolished and it is recognized that wildlife is an international resource. Wildlife continues to be regulated by law, which is informed by science. Additionally, wildlife conservation is still funded through license fees and excise taxes on hunting and fishing equipment. All of these concepts come together to form a model of wildlife conservation that is unique to North America. They are considered to be the guiding principles of what is known as the North American model of wildlife conservation. These seven foundational concepts still inform and define wildlife management today. They evolved with a story of wildlife conservation. They are so important that each principle is worth review. Wildlife is held in the public trust. The wildlife resource belongs to all citizens and is managed by the government for the benefit of all current and future generations. Commerce in wildlife is regulated. Commercial hunting and the sale of wildlife and their parts is restricted to ensure sustainability of wildlife populations. Hunting and fishing laws are created through public process. Since the public owns the wildlife resource, people have the opportunity and the responsibility to help shape the laws that govern wildlife conservation. Everyone has the opportunity to hunt and fish. Unlike some other countries, hunting and angling is not restricted to those with wealth or land. The opportunity to participate is guaranteed for all in good standing. Hunters and anglers fund conservation. Hunting and fishing license sales and taxes on hunting and fishing equipment pay for the management of all wildlife, including non-game species. Wildlife is an international resource. Wildlife do not recognize international boundaries. Therefore, effective conservation requires coordinated wildlife and habitat management strategies among countries. Science is the basis for wildlife policy. Wildlife population management, including the limited use of wildlife as a renewable resource, is based on sound, up-to-date science. Representative John Lacey, a visionary from Iowa who sponsored the Lacey Act, stated to the 56th Congress in 1900 that, by taking this course, we will set an example to other countries and the good work of bird and game protection in America may serve as a model. He was right, it is a model.
the North American model of wildlife conservation. <laughs>